Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Felice Pace. He was born on January 10, 1947, into the working-class Italian community in South Philadelphia. He holds a BA in economics from Yale, an MA in education from Montclair State University, and a lifetime California teaching credential. He's worked as a teacher, educator, laborer, outward-bound instructor, social service administrator, and as a consultant to Native American tribes. For 15 years, Felice worked for and led the Klamath Forest Alliance as program coordinator, executive director, and program director. He remains part of the Alliance's core group. Currently, Felice coordinates the project to reform public land grazing in Northern California. He also contracts with environmental organizations. Contract work includes environmental advocacy, campaign planning, strategy and implementation, development and implementation of administrative systems and program work. He also engages as a Klamath River and Forest activist and pursues a number of writing projects. He blogs on the Klamath River issues at www.clamblog.org. Uh, Felice's personal website, which includes many of his writings, can be found at www.paceonearth.com, Pace on Earth. Uh, Felice is divorced with two adult children. His interests include gardening, nature study, backpacking, and travel. He's lived in Northwest California's Klamath River Basin since 1976. He currently resides at Klamath Glen near the mouth of the Klamath River. So first, thank you for your work, and second, thank you for being on the program. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, so let's talk about the, the the Klamath, and a lot of people outside the region might not know a lot about it, but it has been and is a very important river. Um, so So tell me about the Klamath. Tell us about the Klamath. Well, the Klamath is one of the four great rivers of the West, along with the Columbia, the Sacramento San Joaquin, and the and the Colorado. Uh, but it's much less known than the other ones, partially because it doesn't have any big cities. But it does cut through the Cascades, like the Columbia. And most of our salmon rivers uh, rise on the west side of the Cascades and the Sierra Nevada. Uh, so because the Klamath cuts through into the upper basin, which is volcanic, it's uh, naturally a, a has high nutrient loads. And that probably meant it produced more salmon because most of our salmon streams are relatively nutrient poor. But with these big lakes like Upper Klamath Lake and Lower Klamath Lake in the upper basin, these old lakes, we had a lot of nutrients coming in and a lot of salmon production. So, but, uh, of course, uh, the canneries decimated the spring run, which was the, the big run uh, of salmon, and which the tribes, the, the Klamath River Basin also has uh, several uh, Native American tribes that uh, were not as decimated necessarily as some of the other tribes because they were uh, more isolated, particularly the ones in the lower basin. Uh, but... Uh, the spring salmon run was decimated uh, by the canneries, which came in in the early 1900s, and then they started building dams and blocking uh, the spring salmon from uh, the Shasta River Basin, uh, sub-basin, and from the upper basin, and uh, that pretty much wiped out the spring run, which is now a, a small remnant run, uh, running right now in the Klamath River, however. So uh, the fall run is still one of the better runs, although uh, sometimes you know it's affected like all the other salmon runs by climate change, agricultural diversions. The big problem for salmon in this basin is agricultural diversions, which takes about 80% of the summer and fall uh, base flows, which are the low season flows. So that's, uh, that's one of the issues that we're dealing with here as well as these dams. So let's let's back up a second. And do you know any um, quotes or any any sort of indicators of the uh, size of the runs pre-conquest? There's one line I know, and this was actually from the 30s. So this is after after the canneries had started that they talked about the river becoming quote. And it's a big river. Um, the river becoming quote black and roiling with fish. There were so many fish in it. So do you do you know of any other, um, you know, old time descriptions? Well, you know, 
I probably have them in my files, but uh, they don't come to mind uh, right now. You know, those those kind of salmon descriptions, walking on the backs of the salmon and so forth and so on, uh, you know, those are those are pretty ubiquitous. We hear about those everywhere. And it and it's true. These runs were abundant uh, uh, and uh, and there were more fish uh, than the the natives could could use. And there was an abundance of fish, and and that's because the Native Americans uh, had ceremonies that regulated the fisheries. They couldn't start fishing. The tribes of, in the Klamath River Basin couldn't start fishing for salmon until the spring salmon ceremonies were complete, and uh, and the runners went out and told the different villages that they could start fishing. So uh, salmon were regulated through a ceremony in a way that preserved the, these fantastic runs that were super abundant. So that's that's the best I can do in terms of telling you some of how the Native Americans uh, were ab able to uh, regulate these fisheries through uh, through their ceremonies. And so the and one one more thing that I've heard about this is I read that prior once again prior to conquest it would be pretty routine for someone to see by the river someone to see a grizzly bear about every 15 minutes. Um, go ahead. Yeah, particularly when the when the salmon were running. And there were runs, uh, uh, you know, there were some breaks in the runs, but they were pretty much year-round. And uh, in the lower elevations and in the, in the meadows and so forth, and along the river, you'd see the grizzly bears. That was a, a big big part of their diet uh, during the during the times that the fish were running so you still see black bears going in the fall uh, when the runs when the salmon are, uh, are spawning and dying in the fall you'll see black bears patrolling uh, the banks regularly looking for those carcasses and uh, they carry those nutrients up the hill as well so the disruption of our of our runs and and the killing off of the of the grizzly has uh, has affected more than just the river and more than just the tribes. Um, it's it's affected how we spread those river those uh, ocean nutrients uphill. So who who are the salmon who run on the either ran or run on the Klamath? What what are the species? Right. Right. We have uh, right now uh, the Chinook is the big species, and there's the spring run of Chinook that we discussed, and the fall run, and those were the most prized fish, uh, both by the Native Americans and still are, and uh, and and by the by the white folks. So uh, there's the spring run and the fall run, and uh, there's steelhead, of course, and uh, there were summer runs of steelhead. Still is a summer run up into the New River on the Trinity River. Uh, that goes up there, and um, most of your listeners will know that the spring salmon, they went up and and on the spring snow melt, they were able to get much higher up into these, way up into what are now our wilderness areas in the Trinity Alps and the Marble Mountains and uh, up toward Crater Lake and places like that, and uh, they waited, then they got into those deep cold holes and waited for fall in order to spawn, and they and they died. The fall fish couldn't get that far up, so they spawned in the in the lower parts of the streams. Um, and through all that, I sort of forgot your question. So the question was, bring me what, back. Are the, what are the species of? So there's chinook, um, steelhead. Um, yeah. I know there's coho there up, were, up here. Yes, there are coho down here too, and the coho are listed as threatened. Um, should probably be listed as endangered because they uh, primarily use the lower gradient streams that are in the Shasta and the Scott Valley that were that are now um, agricultural fields. So their habitat and the beaver, the beaver dams and the beaver ponds that uh, made up uh, there and kept the water cold. Those are gone now. So the we have a, a remnant run of the coho. We also have a few pinks, pink salmon that still come in, uh, a dog salmon, uh, sea run cutthroat down in the bottom of the of the river, and I think that's about it for our anadromous for our salmon related species. Um, okay, so can you bring us through the 
Well, uh, just just to mention, who are the who are the Indian nations who live along the 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 Klamath? Right down at the very mouth and extending about 30 miles up to where the uh, Hoopa Reservation starts is the Yurok Tribes territory, and it extended down the coast. Uh, to uh, almost to well about to Trinidad just past Trinidad uh, toward Eureka and Arcata and then uh, going upriver you had uh, the Kuduk Indians and by the way Yuruk means uh, Yurok or Yuruk means downriver in the Kuduk language Kuduk means upriver and Modok Moduk or Modok means uh, way upriver <laughs> Uh, that's all in the Kaduk language. The Yurok language, they call themselves Polikala, which, uh, like most tribes, means the people. Uh, and then on the Trinity, uh, Lower Trinity River, you had the, and still have, the Hoopa tribe. Uh, then you had the Shasta Nation, which was in the, in the agricultural valleys where, uh, around where I-5 and Mount Shasta now are, the Shasta and the Scott Valleys, and because that's where the settlers were, those, that tribe almost got wiped out. It's not federally recognized now. There's a couple of small groups that are, are trying to do that. Um, then, uh, you have the Modoc, uh, tribe up above, and many people will know about Captain Jack, uh, his Indian name was Kientpus, and uh, he was a leader of the Modoc tribe. Uh, they fought the last, uh, it, what's known as the last Indian War in the USA, uh, where they held off uh, the U.S. Army for uh, several months. And then the Klamath tribe, and uh, and some Paiute, some Paiute people up in the far upper basin. Uh, the Klamath tribe. Tribes, what's called the Klamath tribes now, is made up of Modoc, Klamaths, and and those Paiutes, Hayuskan band of the Paiute Indians, and uh, we have six, five other recognized tribes in the basin: the Quartz Valley Reservation in the Scott, mostly Kaduk people, the uh, Kaduk tribe, which was only federally recognized in 1979 based on continuing their ceremonies continuously, uh, and uh, and then the Hoopa, the Hoopa tribe, the Yurok tribe, and the Resigeni Rancheria, a small federal tribe made up of Yurok people that is uh, located within the bounds of the Yurok reservation. And, uh, you know, for those that may not know much about uh, Indian history, uh, these federal tribes are uh, creations of the federal government as a way of uh, dealing with the, with the people uh, that they Europeans conquered. And the the I don't know about the um, the people who live down on the Klamath. And for listeners, I live about oh ten miles north of the Klamath. And this is up in Talawa territory. I know that the Talawa, if you believe the Talawa, they lived here since the beginning of time. And if you believe science, they lived here for at least twelve thousand five hundred years. And the point is that these were people of the salmon, and they lived here sustainably for. You know, if you believe science, they lived here sustainably for more than 12,000 years. And if you believe them, then they lived here since the beginning of time sustainably. So people relied on salmon for a very, very long time. Right. And it's it's very much the same for these tribes. In fact, the tribes here on the Klamath uh, are considered to be the southernmost of the, of the northwest uh, Indian tribes, the salmon tribes of the northwest. And they all had uh, various ceremonies uh, around the salmon and revered the salmon quite a bit. So, so the the canneries came in. Let's go through a history then of the last hundred years. The canneries came in and started to hammer the 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 salmon, and then the um, the dams went in. Can you talk about the dams for a moment? Well, the dams, uh, you know, they had plans, like most rivers, they had plans all the way up and down the rivers, but uh, the, it was really the sportsmen, the fishermen who stopped the dam building, uh, but we did have uh, dams beginning in the early uh, 1920s and, uh, and then continuing right through to the 1960s. They put in the, the last dam on the Klamath, which was Iron Gate Dam. It's the lowest dam. It's just a little bit up upstream and east 
of Interstate 5 and near where the near near the Oregon California border just south of there and uh, that dam was put in without fish ladders some of the other dams did have they were a little smaller they did have fish ladders and these were hydroelectric dams that were put in they're not irrigation dams they're not flood control dams they they play almost no role in flood control and uh, there's no irrigation water that comes out of them and uh, at some point those dams I can't remember exactly maybe in the 50s or 60s they were purchased by uh, what's now Pacificor Pacific Power uh, and Pacificor it's a company owned by Berkshire Hathaway now which is uh, owned by uh, what's that guy's name Derek Warren Buffett Warren Buffett, that's the man, and uh, you know he's he's owned these dams for a while, and that's going to come up uh, a little later on. I have a few on. So the dams went in, and when Iron Gate went in, uh, it blocked uh, the salmon uh, and uh, finished off, uh, you know, most of the spring run and started affecting the fall run. Of course, they at that time during the dam building era. The idea uh, that was perpetrated by the dam builders was that, oh, well, we'll just put in a hatchery and that will mitigate for the loss of the fisheries above this dam. So we don't have to put in. That's why they didn't put in a, uh, a fish ladder. They said, well, we'll just uh, give some money from the power, uh, the power profits to run a fish hatchery, and that's run by the Department of Fish and Game right below Iron Gate. And what's wrong with that? Well, we've learned that, number one, fish hatcheries always narrow the genetics of the species that they're taking. Uh, because they don't take all the fish, they only take some of the fish, and they tend to take the earlier fish because they want to make sure they get enough eggs. Uh, they are selecting certain genetic uh, legacies to be magnified. And they spawn those fish, they grow them under control, then they feed them and all that. So there's many more hatchery fish. So over time, just by selecting fish into a fish hatchery, you narrow the genetics. And we know that when you narrow the genetics, the, the species becomes more susceptible to uh, what we call stochastic events, random events, uh, uh, floods, storms, droughts. Uh, that may then wipe them out because they don't have the the genes to have those individuals that are are adapted uh, better adapted to that uh, change situation. And at this point, what percentage of the fish on the Klamath of the salmon on the Klamath are hatchery versus wild? Well, it depends on the species because on the Trinity we have we have a you know a big federal dam. Uh, that that diverts water over to the Central Valley and down down to the San Joaquin Valley, and um, it takes about 50 percent of the water out of the Trinity on a yearly basis. So that that hatchery there, uh, they they actually do steelhead and coho as well as chinook, um, and they do steelhead and chinook fall. It's all fall chinook now up in the uh, up in the Iron Gate hatchery on the Klamath side. So uh, most of the fish, you know, it, it varies by year, um, and we have we do have a uh, a target that's been set by the Pacific Fisheries Management Council for natural spawners. Uh, most years we've been meeting that in recent years, but many years, uh, uh, some years we don't we don't meet it uh, because they tend to over allocate the fish uh, that are to uh, the various fishermen. The fish, like in all over the Pacific Northwest, the Native Americans have 50% of the catchable fish, and the the uh, the white folks, the, the white fishermen, have 50% mostly as sport, but also commercial in the ocean. Uh, so uh, it varies, but um, you know, if we have enough natural spawners, it's about 40. 1,000 natural spawners uh, that we're supposed to have to have maximum natural production, and that would be about 40 amount to about 40 percent of the fish. But it it goes up and down by years because some years we don't meet our spawning escapement or conditions. The, the big problem in the Klamath now is that we're losing the juvenile fish to 
salmon diseases that are that are made epidemic. They're natural diseases, but they're made epidemic uh, by the bad water quality that's related partly to the dams, but mostly to um, about oh, roughly 400,000 acres of irrigated agriculture in the upper Klamath Basin above above the dams and then in the Shasta and Scott sub-basins uh, near I-5. So I want to talk about that, the the, the water um, water quality and water taking water for agriculture in a moment. But before we do that, um, I am guilty of this myself, and and it's happening again here. So I just want to give a shout out to lampreys and other fish because we talk often about the effects of these dams on salmon, but there are other fish that people don't talk about very often who are just who are also deserve to be recognized. So. Can you talk about some of the other fish species? There's lampreys, the importance of lampreys, and then there are, on the upper Klamath, there is a type of sucker. There's two types, actually. Yeah, sure. Let's let's talk about that. Let's start a bit with the uh, lampreys, which we call here eels. Uh, the fishermen and the Native Americans call them eels, but they're lampreys. And sometimes you'll see them attached to a salmon, or you'll see a sore on a salmon where a, a lamprey was attached. But they're amazing creatures, and they're a, uh, a basic food food for the Native Americans. Uh, in the winter time, they start uh, they start running in February, and um, and they're they're hooked uh, with hooks. People stand at the mouth and and hook them or take them with uh, gloves on their hands in the shallows further up river. By about June, they get way up into the uh, reaches of the Scott Valley, for example. Um, but the lamprey, very important uh, fish and uh, an amazing, an amazing creature because they can literally throw themselves uh, up uh, waterfalls by attaching and then throwing, attaching their mouth and throwing their body up and then flipping up and attaching their mouth again. It's it's just an amazing sight. They're an amazing creature. Up in the upper basin, uh, like all over the west, uh, you know, we have uh, what are called sucker species. Um, and uh, these species, it's thought when evolved from the species in the big inland sea uh, in the great, what's, what's now the Great Basin and uh, area. And... Um, but they became isolated, so now we have things like the goose nest, goose, uh, the goose lake sucker that's only in Goose Lake, and so forth. Many, many sucker species in the interior west. But in the upper Klamath, we have what in the Klamath language is called Kuptu and Chuam. That's the Lost River and the Short Nose suckers, and these were very important food source and ceremonial fish, just like the salmon. Uh, for the people of the upper basin, the Klamaths and the Modocs and the Huskin uh, peoples up there, they utilize the suckers, which get huge. They get as big as salmon in, uh, in these big uh, interior lakes. And then they run up the rivers to spawn, and that's when the natives would take them both for ceremony and for uh, for subsistence. So that's uh, those are those are the fishes. There there were other fishes, you know, like uh, ulecon, candlefish in the in the estuary and places like that that the natives uh, relied on as well. Uh, but uh, you're you're absolutely correct. In fact, uh, most of the attention gets focused on the salmon uh, because of our romance around them, I guess. So let's talk about. Um, okay, so the dams went up and. That um, was an, another blow to the fish, but then there's also this is a problem not just in the Klamath, but in water in rivers all over. I know that in the Colorado River, the Colorado River no longer reaches the ocean um, much of the time. 25% um, of the rivers in the world no longer reach the ocean. Uh, the Rio Grande no longer reaches the ocean. Oftentimes, um, there's we could go through a whole long list, and the Klamath at least reaches the ocean, but um, oh, and I also want to say about the Colorado that 110% of the water in the Colorado is allocated to be taken out, 110%, and they're building more pipelines to take more out. So with the Klamath also, you said, I mean, it's horrifying to me that you said, what was it, 50% of the Trinity is sent south? Yes. Um, and 
there was the famous statement, the, the basically the famous, I don't remember the exact words, but basically the ruling back in, what was it, 2002 or 2003 that, that fish don't actually need water, um, if you remember the whole controversy over that, I may be overstating, but so can you talk about the, the, the water removal from the Klamath Basin? Sure. And and first, let's. this is true of every river in the West. Uh, 80, 70 to 90 percent of what we call the base flow, which is the low, the dry season flow, the late summer and fall flow uh, that the, the, the fall runs depend on, um, are taken and uh, by agriculture. Oh, it's wait, the I big say water. One more, yeah. I want to say one, one more ahead. thing, which is just a couple days ago, last week, and the point is not to bash Trump as Trump, but just say he's a mainstream politician saying this. He actually said in California that water that reaches the ocean in a river is wasted. Yeah, that's Anyways, that's sorry. Go ahead. That's common for agricultural people. So he's uh, he heard that from some ag guys, and he's he's repeated it. Um, they consider any water that flows to the ocean to be wasted. Um, and they don't care about fish too much. Most 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 of these uh, big growers, um, but every it's true of every river in the West. The other thing that's true is when they in the 1950s and 60s, when the states were fighting over the water in the West, um, they did river compacts and they got the feds and the federal government and the states got together and they divided the water of these rivers. And they noted at that time that there were uh, any number of tribal claims, federal and treaty rights and federal reserved right claims that went with the reservations um, that could come uh, were were not were, had not been asserted but could be asserted by tribes and, and likely would be. But they put those aside, those potential or what, what they call paper water rights of the tribes to the side and they said, well, we, we're not going to deal with that. We're just going to divide the water above themselves. So um, that's why we have seen since the 1980s over 30 water settlements in the West that have been ratified by Congress. And uh, these are involving tribes and invi involving tribal water rights. And uh, we that's the, the water deal on the Klamath is one of those that was trying to get through Congress but hasn't made it. There's there's 30 to 60 more of these, and I've looked at maybe 10, 15 of them in depth, and uh, they're very problematic because basically uh, in 19 in the late in the 1980s, the Native American Rights Fund out of Colorado, a nonprofit uh, Native organization, and uh, but not tribal, and um, and the Western Governors Association went to the feds and they said, look, all these tribal claims are starting to come in. It's going to cause all this conflict because the tribes have the priority date of when the uh, treaty was made or when the reservation was founded. And that gives them, in many cases, the most senior water rights in the basin. But uh, they're going to have to take – they're going to be taking the water once they assert these rights from – white agriculture uh, agricultural people mainly mainly white folks uh, some uh, you know Mexican uh, heritage type people and even Indians that farm but primarily the farmers uh, the ag community is is white Europeans and um, and they have the water but uh, if these tribes bring in these rights uh, they're going to have the water and that's going to cause a lot of conflict so uh, they convinced the feds that they should fund these settlements and push these settlements. And basically, uh, what I see is that the settlements, most of them, some tribes have done better than others in these negotiations, but uh, the tribes are basically dependent on the federal government. And so what the federal government has tended to do is to uh, offer them money in exchange for water rights, giving up their water rights, or... Uh, or uh, agreeing not to exercise those. So I think uh, that the agenda of the federal government has been to keep the water with the white irrigators, with agriculture, and and not with the tribes. And if the tribes went through uh, most of these tribes and perfected their rights, asserted and perfected their rights, uh, they would be the main water brokers in the West. 
I don't know how much water it would be if you added up all the potential tribal claims in the West, but it might be a quarter, a third, half of the water in the West. So the tribes would uh, – that, that would be uh, – uh, sort of uh, decolonization, a kind of a, uh, decolonization action if the tribes actually had control of the water and the white people had to come to them when they wanted water to uh, irrigate their fields. Um, so the feds, I think, who are supposed to be a trustee, the trustee of the tribes and is supposed to act in their interest, I don't believe has acted in their interest. Right. Are you there? Hello? The agenda of the feds has been to keep the water with those federal irrigation projects, and that's that's what's happened in the Klamath uh, so far. Ah, so another connection problem, it's saying. Yeah, but it's back now. We just we just lost okay. about and it was only like one sentence. I think it'll be okay. Um, okay. So um, the we're we're about at the 30 minute mark of the of the 45 to 48 minutes so can we start talking about the current agreement and the current agreement about on dam removal and can we talk about the good and bad things about the current situation sure there are there are two uh two pending agreements in the uh, Klamath River Basin one is the dam agreement uh the dams came up for relicensing Pacificor owned by Berkshire Hathaway uh, and Warren Buffett uh, they wanted to re relicense those dams but uh, they at some point in that process I participated some in that process the tribes did uh, lots of agencies and at some point an administrative law judge made a decision about whether there needed to be fish ladders the administrative law judge in the federal energy regulatory licensing process said, okay, if you want to relicense these dams, you got to put fish ladders in. And that work, that actually work. And that would cost a lot of money. So the California Energy Commission estimated that if the dams were relicensed, they would lose $20 million on average a year um, because uh, uh, they – mainly because they wouldn't be able to turn the river on and off, the, what they call ramping rates uh, in between the dams. But anyway, when that happened, the dams became a an a, a, uh, underperforming asset that the company wanted to get rid of. So it came to the table and wanted to make a deal. That's the, the, uh, the dam deal, which was supposed to uh, originally designed – to go through Congress, it's now go back in the FERC process under this new agreement. So basically, the dam agreement is a sweetheart deal for uh, the one percent for the rich folks, uh, a very rich and influential corporation, uh, to relieve them of the responsibility for these dams that it owns. Uh, so basically. Uh, the ratepayers and the taxpayers are going to pay to take the dams out. They're going to be transferred to a uh, a, uh, a a nonprofit corporation, and uh, Pacificor, the owner of the dams, is going to get to walk away, including walking away from any toxic legacies that are around those old powerhouses and transmission facilities. And it's very likely that there are PC. Bees uh, there and other kinds of toxics that haven't been fully assessed. Uh, but you know, even though it's a sweetheart deal for a big corporation, we are going to get the, get rid of the dams in that process. Um, that is four dams. The fifth dam that Pacific Corps owns, Kino, in the upper basin, would be transferred to the Bureau of Reclamation because it uh, keeps water levels at levels that the Bureau can uh, supply the federal irrigation uh, farmers and growers. So, um, but uh, those are low dams in the upper basin that re will remain and they have fish ladders that actually work. So, um, uh, we'll get rid of the dams, the fish will get back to the upper basin, the salmon and other fishes, so the lamprey and so forth. So, uh, um, that's that's the dam deal. Uh, Anything else that yeah, I should that, tell you about that? Well, what will that do? You you mentioned water quality before, and and we have 
the the wonderful and completely expected story of the recovery of the Elwha after the dam removal there, um, can we expect uh, two two questions? Can we expect a similar recovery of the Klamath? And the other question is, you mentioned that the juveniles are dying from um, from diseases that are worsened by uh, taking water out. So I guess three questions. Question one, will we, can we expect some sort of realistic miracle? Two, what will the water flows be on the Klamath post dam removal? Oh, also, when, when are the dams supposed to be removed? And three, um, will, do you think this will help the health of the juvenile salmon? Okay, well let's, uh, um, most of the water quality problem that we have is is the result of agriculture, um, and uh, we get all 200,000 acres of federal wastewater, agricultural wastewater, and another 200,000 acres of uh, non-federal uh, irrigator uh, wastewater, and and it's really bad water, and it can be cleaned up by by using uh, restoring. Uh, some of our marshes up there, but uh, that would take agricultural land, and so far, particularly those federal irrigators have resisted any kind of reduction uh, in the land that they can that they can farm. Uh, so the taking out the dams make really bad water quality worse, and taking out the dams. Uh, if you read the studies, and I think they're correct, I've read them, uh, the assessments that have been done, it will improve water quality. It may, it, it likely will lessen our toxic algae problem, uh, but it won't solve our nutrient problem and it won't solve our temperature problem. And uh, the two things, no, the salmon diseases, the salmon diseases during the drought wiped up, wiped out up to 90 to 100 percent of the juvenile salmon that were produced on the on the Klamath River, and now the big trib not not counting the Trinity, which is a big lower tri uh, lower tributary tr lower tributary excuse me, but it's uh, it's the biggest tributary is the Trinity River. It's really the south fork of the Klamath River, and uh, but on the Klamath side, uh, we. They radio tagged some of those juveniles and found that only 8% of the juveniles were making it to the estuary. Now, these are salmon diseases that are natural, but they should be taking out maybe 10% on a healthy river. 10% or so of the of the fish would die, of the juvenile fish, to these to these salmon diseases. But here, even in good water years, we're losing 40%, 50%, and in uh, in bad water years, like up to 90 to 100 percent of the juveniles. One of the reasons why fishing is restricted this year is because of the drought's impact on the production of salmon out of the out of the uh, Klamath River. Now, uh, taking out the dams should help a little bit, but again, until we deal with this agricultural uh, wastewater. Uh, which we're trying to get the uh, North Coast Water Quality Control Board to deal with, but it's it's very difficult. And Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, um, you know, what I found, Derek, is that uh, the agencies really don't want to enforce the Clean Water Act when it comes to agriculture and forestry. They just refuse to really. They'll write permits, they'll do studies, uh, but they won't really regulate, which is what their job's supposed to be. So um, until we start to uh, deal with agricultural wastewater in this country, it's what's polluting now what the big problem in most of our, our watersheds, uh, most of our river systems all over the country and, and really all over the world, and we're not dealing with it. So um, let's see. The dams are, are slated to come out in 2020 uh, or Flows, taking out the dam will not affect flows one bit. The flows are controlled by the Bureau of Reclamation in the upper basin. They're not controlled by the dams. The dams don't, don't use any water. They don't divert any water. So our, our poor flows will continue. And uh, that gets uh, to the second deal, uh, which I hope we're going to get to talk about, which is the water deal that's being renegotiated. 
So as far as the health to the fish, um, you know, it shouldn't be as bad, but it's still going to be bad until we deal with. Uh, and what the scientists are telling us is that the two uh, issues that they think can uh, affect, that do and affect the uh, the rate of disease of these diseases and whether they're epidemic are uh, number one flows. So higher flows can flush some of the disease organisms. There's a, a co-host, the polycheat worm in the gravels, that if we get high flows, it flushes some of those disease organisms out and lowers the disease rates. And then water temperature. We need to lower the water temperature. The, taking out the dams will help marginally with that, but again, uh, most of our agriculture, they don't protect their streams. Uh, they don't shade their streams. Uh, they farm right down to the streams, and and nobody is uh, is challenging them on that, or uh, the agencies that are supposed to uh, give us clean water aren't giving it to us. So we're not meeting water quality standards for temperature, nutrients, and several other things, dissolved oxygen. So I think that answers that set of questions. So let's let's talk about the. We have about um, about ten minutes left. Good. Um, let's talk about the water, the water deal, because because yes. everything you're saying so far is um, is breaking my heart. Um, because for once, it's like yay, yay, dams are going to come out, something's going to go the right direction, and it's not really going to help as much as we had hoped. So, and I recognize the difference between this and the Elwha in that the Elwha, the upper the upper river, is not an agricultural territory. That's, that's no, it's actually an Olympic National Park, and that's that's why those fish were able to recover so quickly. Exactly. So let's talk about the water deal. Okay. So uh, the water deal basically uh, is going to be renegotiated, and that's a really good thing. If you look at – if and your, your readers were to look at Clam Blog and some of the analysis in there, the whole reason I started it was to – uh, get information out about these these deals that were being negotiated between behind closed doors, and now they're going to go in behind closed doors again and renegotiate the water deal. Uh, and um, but I think you know hopefully the tribes will be stronger, and will insist that we get enough water down the Klamath River. What we have what we have, Derek, is a situation like we have in almost every Western river basin where the water has been over allocated. I referred to when they divided up the water that they said, well, later for the Indians, we're just not going to deal with that. Well, now as the, native, as the natives come in and as studies of flows come in, and in order to, uh, we're, we're over allocated. So we have to reduce the amount of agriculture. We got to come down with maybe 20% less agriculture. And, uh, We've already had projects to $50 million in the 2008 Farm Bill to increase agricultural uh, water uh, efficiency um, and uh, didn't, didn't produce one drop more water into the river, but it, uh, it helped the farmers out quite a bit. Uh, uh, but it's another story we don't have time for. So basically, um, the tribes and the fishing groups that are in there in these negotiations, including Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Association, Trout Unlimited, California Trout, they need to insist that the river gets enough, riv enough water. What we need in that water deal is, number one, we need a basin-wide flow assessment. Uh, and in the interim, we need some flows uh, that are going to that are going to lower this disease situation. We have some flow, partial flow studies, and we know that we need more water, particularly in the late summer and fall. But especially in terms of this disease situation, we need the spring flows. They want to hold all the spring flows in the upper basin because in Upper Klamath Lake because that maximizes the amount of irrigation they can do. But we need spring flows, and the tribes have got to go in there and insist upon that. And thank goodness for the Hoopa tribe. They've been very strong in all this, and uh, they just they recently filed a 60-day notice to sue over the Endangered Species Act because the coho, which are listed, are not getting taken care of, and the uh, Klamath Irrigation Project, the Federal Irrigation Project, is, is killing the coho and wiping them out. So that's, uh, that's that deal in a nutshell. You can uh, maybe help by uh, asking another question. <laughs> um, 
Well, is there a question you have in mind? No, you want me to oh, ask? no. I was just, uh, you know, I had ran ran out, but they're okay. You know, so what 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 do you think the chances are of of something good coming out of a water deal with given the strength of the hoopa and of and of whatever other nations are being strong too? Well, I think the chances are are good. They're definitely better than they were. Number one, because the people. Uh, know a little bit more now. Um, all these secret negotiations, none of these tribes, you know, really told their people what was in it. The Klamath tribes up in the upper basin, they had elections to ratify the deal, the water deals when they were made. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot more scrutiny now. Clam blog's there, and they know, you know, that through the Hoopa tribe and through Clam blog and, and others, uh, they're not going to be able to to sneak through these bad deals. By the way, in that water deal that they wanted to put through Congress, there's 19 pages of regulatory assurances for federal irrigators with respect to the Endangered Species Act and California and Oregon species law. Basically, uh, that if that deal had gone through Congress, uh, the Endangered Species Act and and the California laws and the Oregon laws dealing with wildlife would not apply to the federal irrigators. Uh, they wanted it to apply to everybody else except them. They want to be insulated, both in in and in that deal they were insulated as well from the tribal rights. So thank goodness that didn't make it through uh, Congress. But now they're going to be renegotiated. These deals never go away. You know, Derek, I think when historians look back at these water deals, and as I mentioned before, 30 of them have already gone, gone through Congress. And whenever a new one comes up, uh, it's always praised by the press, by the governors, by the local governments, by everybody, because basically the Indians are, are trading the and it's not the Indians, it's the tribal governments that are federal creations that are trading water rights or the ability to exercise those rights for funding. And often it's funding for things like the one of the Navajo deals, a pipeline to two towns that never had water, running water, where people had to haul water. For the Nez Perce, uh, jobs at the federal hatchery and some new sewage systems for two of their towns. So these cash cash strap tribe uh, tribes that are federal tribes that are dependent on the federal government i mean they're being offered things like restoration you know restoration is being promoted by the federal government and funding for restoration as an alternative to water you know as if we could have uh, oh it's okay that we dewater these rivers or you know decimate the flows because uh, and have this bad water quality cuz we're going to fund the tribes and other other groups to do some restoration that's going to make it all good. That's uh, that's pie in the sky, and it's a road to extinction. So I think historians are going to look back at these the tribal water deals and this this era of uh, water rights settlements as the second big ripoff of our tribes. First, they came in the Europeans, the conquerors, our ancestors, and they and they uh, they they tried they took the land and they attempted to exterminate the people. They had extermination campaigns in Northern California from the 1860s to the 1890s. Uh, men, women, and children burning the, burning the villages and, uh, and killing the people. And now they've come back to take the water. So uh, this is, uh, this is the, the continuation, in my view, of colonialism. And uh, and the tribes, these tribal governments, creations of the federal government have been uh, selling out uh, their tribes. Now, not every one of these agreements, the Crow tribes, some of the tribes have done pretty good, in my uh, in my opinion, anyway. The Crow tribe is is an example. The uh, Utes, some of the Utes, the Southern Utes, have uh, really hung tough and negotiated strong. And down on the Navajos now, uh, you got the activists, the native activists uh, in Diné Care and other uh, activists who are keeping that tribe in line. So uh, I think things are beginning to change a little bit, but uh, it's the historians are not going to look kindly on this period. No, when you first mentioned it, it, it seemed that we just changed one word. I mean, Red Cloud had this great line about, they made us many promises more than I can remember. And they only kept but one. They promised that they would take our land, and they did it. 
and yeah. I was thinking just change one word and that still is true. They promised they would take our water and they did it. Um, so we have like one minute left. So first, what can people who A, live in the Klamath Basin or B, don't, what can they do to help? And, and then I guess that's my last question. Well, the people that live here, we need to keep our governments uh, in line, you know, whether it's the tribal governments, uh, any government needs oversight. And so we need to keep an eye on these on these government officials. And uh, we need to push that these negotiations not be private. Uh, and and, uh, you know, and if folks want to check out Clam Blog, uh, that's a place it's clamblog at blogspot.com, actually, but that's a place where you can get information uh, about what's going on, uh, the Hoopa tribe, others. But um, the main thing is for the people in the basin to be involved and to insist that these things not be secret, that the negotiations, they should really be out in the open. This is a people's river. It belongs to all of us. The water belongs to all of us, and especially to the native people. So uh, that's that's what we should be pushing for. Sunlight is the best thing, and uh, and just keep an eye on the governments, keep them honest. Well, thank you so much. I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Felice Pace. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. <laughs>